Welcome. This is Michael Hart, and in this module, we're going to talk about parsing out ADHD and dyslexia. Now, this is a very common issue that comes up a lot in, in classrooms, and um, I think it's not only relevant for educators, but I also think it's important for parents and tutors and specialists to understand how we can build a lens or a template for figuring out how to separate out those two. Now, I do understand that there are times where the child is struggling with both ADHD and dyslexia, but I think if we spend a little bit of time separating out the two, that'll actually help us try to figure out when both issues are interacting at the same time. So the focus here is to provide a common language that will help parents, specialists, tutors, and educators to approach this issue in a way that allows them to build an effective remediation plan. That's the critical variable, right? We all want to figure out, okay, fine, that's what it is. What do we actually do about it? Now, I always like to start with a roadmap. And as I was developing this module, I realized that the smartest thing to do would be to break it out into two parts. And we're really going to go from general to specific. So in part one, we're going to have a general conversation about several of these issues here. In part two, we're going to drill down and get very granular with regard to what these profiles look like in terms of test patterns so that we can be very specific in determining where one begins and the other ends as best we can. Because I know that sometimes it can be very complex, but I think this will help take you a long way in terms of having a great model to attack this issue in a way that's going to be more, help you feel like you're being more effective. Now, I'm also going to have a quick discussion about medication. That comes up a lot. I have my own opinions about it, I think, that are based on my 25 years of history. I'm going to share those with you. Obviously, when you signed up for this webinar or this module, you received a copy of my slides so that you're able to follow along my slides, take notes as you need to. And in addition, you're going to also get some links at the end where there are going to be certain specific issues that you'd like to drill down into more deeply. I'm going to make sure that you have access to some of the seminal articles that will allow us to do that. So let's get started on part one. And let me just give you a bit of an overview. I think it behooves us to continue to have a conversation about the current status or the evolution of the definition of dyslexia. And that, of course, means that we've got to talk about rap rapid automatic naming and how that reflects some other underlying cognitive processes separate from just phonological awareness that have a significant impact on a person's development of fluency and comprehension. So we're going to talk a moment about Marianne Wolf's double deficit hypothesis. We're going to talk a little bit about what Pennington found in his research. And I want to have a brief discussion about the differences in the neural pathways that we're finding for phonological awareness versus rapid automatic naming that helps us understand that they're two different issues, which means that therefore they then need to be treated differently in our remediation plans. Now, I just think that it's important for us, whenever we have a conversation about dyslexia, that we have a specific conversation about the current status, because I think it is just that. It's the current status. And as we do more research, and we learn more from the brain studies, it's going to serve us well in terms of having a better understanding of all the different issues or components with regard to how your brain is wired and how that impacts reading, writing, and spelling. Now, at the end of part one, I'm going to talk about DSM-5 and ADHD. The critical variable here, I think, is that We'll talk about the description of ADHD in the DSM-5. Probably more importantly, we're also going to talk about what didn't quite get represented as well as it should have, and that has to do with assessing a child or a person's performance with regard to ADHD in a certain context, as well as this 
broader overarching concept of self-regulation and executive functioning. So we'll talk about that as well, and that'll help us follow, uh, finish up with part one. Now in part two, as I said, we're going to get really deeply into very specific information about very specific cognitive processes. And that will help us get to where we need to go in terms of uh, next steps with, the, with our kids. I don't think there's anybody listening right now that isn't aware that the current status of dyslexia is becoming more complex and we're taking a lot of information that we may have known about in the scientific community for the last few decades and that's becoming normal and customary in the lay audience. It's very interesting. A scientist by the name of Thomas Kuhn wrote a book about the structure of scientific revolutions. I think it was in the 70s. And one of the core tenets of the, of the book was that it usually takes about 75 years for a scientific discovery to kind of filter into and become general knowledge for the lay audience. But clearly now, obviously, because of the internet, we've been able to collapse that. And we're still not quite as quick to incorporate everything that's going on in the scientific research as we uh, probably likely will be in the next couple of decades. But we've learned a tremendous amount with regard to not just phonological processing, but also this concept of rapid automatic naming with regard to dyslexia. So Martha Denkla from Johns Hopkins was talking about rapid automatic naming in the 70s. Her protege, Marianne Wolf, has certainly increased the conversation and has made it much more public that, there, that rapid automatic naming should be considered a, oftentimes a core component to what we call dyslexia, and that there is a potential there for a child to struggle with just phonological awareness, and another child may just be dealing with rapid automatic naming. And then there is a third category where the person appears to be challenged by both. But of course, you know, historically, phonological awareness has become known as this very core deficit. And I think that we need to expand and create a more complex understanding of what we know to be dyslexia because that, of course, informs what we do with our kids. So I found it kind of interesting that the International Dyslexia Association still has their definition from 2002. and. If I had my way and I was on their board, I would see, I would certainly work on updating that because in many ways it is accurate. It is neurological in origin, uh, characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition, poor spelling, decoding, uh, typically resulting from uh, phonological issues. But I found that, it, and the uh, italicies here or the highlight here is actually my highlight because I see now that they they do mention secondary consequences that may include problems in reading comprehension, but they don't really give enough information so that someone who is just coming into the world of dyslexia has an understanding from the very beginning that it's beyond phonological awareness. It's beyond just those particular components of how a child's brain is wired, and we have to make sure that we catch that early on so that when we need to, we're impacting and treating that area as well. Very quickly, Mary Ann Wolf, credible researcher in this area, she was one of the more, more recent researchers who really elucidated and explained how Rapid automatic name is, is a very strong predictor for weaknesses in reading development, specifically with regard to fluency and comprehension. And we're going to talk about breaking out that a little bit in, in just a little while. Now, I alluded to this in the introduction, and I know that this is not the core of what we're doing here, but I think it's important to understand that the functional magnetic resonance imaging studies 
have clearly indicated structures and neural pathways that have to do with phonological issues in the differences between non-dyslexic readers and dyslexic readers. Much more recently, in fact, you'll see a notation at the bottom here from Elizabeth Norton in 2014, they've begun to delineate fMRI studies, different neural pathways or different functional connectivities that separate out or differentiate phonological from uh, rapid automatic name deficits. Now, that's a point I want to make here. It's all under this umbrella of wanting to make sure that we're uh, starting out in the right place with regard to the underlying cognitive processes because that is going to help inform us in part two when we really drill down and get uh, very granular. So in the late 90s, Wolf and her colleague Bowers proposed this idea of the double deficit hypothesis. She did say in this study, which by the way, the link will be there for you at the end of my slides, this is where we're at now, and this is subject to change. It could be phonologically based, Dyslex the dyslexia could be phonologically based, it could be due to higher order fluency processes, or it could be both. Now, I like to talk about, just for a minute, how we're, why it's so important, or the progression that we've gone through so that allows us to make these kinds of claims these days. So obviously in the beginning, prior to functional MRIs, you know, we didn't have the ability to map neural pathways and map activation during specific tasks. So all we had was observation and test results. So in the earlier days, we would use correlation, co Relation. I know many of you already are quite familiar with this, but the idea is that two variables are related to each other, but not necessarily causal. As we got more sophisticated, we had more data, we were able to do regression analysis where uh, we were able to parse out, so to speak, uh, differences in terms of, if you had a big equation, how much of phonological awareness had to do with um, dyslexia and how much did another cognitive processes have to do with dyslexia. But again, it was statistical analysis based on observations and test scores. Now, because of our neuroimaging capabilities, we're really able to start separating out those processes. And you can imagine that has a profound impact on our planning and remediation for these kids because it's not one size fits all. We have to remember as I, I had the opportunity to work with Martha Dinkler for a little while, a couple of years, and she used to tell us all the time, be careful, every brain is different. There's a great deal of developmental variation in how kids' or brains are wired, even when construct of uh, the dyslexic brain and the certain neural pathways being involved. So it is, this is the current status and this is subject to change. Now, Pennington, uh, certainly uh, Marianne Wolf is not alone. Pennington is another one of the uh, very, very um, well-regarded researchers in this space who did a very big study. And, uh, and again, this, will, this study will be available to you in a link at the end of the presentation so that you can drill down into that. They talk about the fact that the single deficit version really isn't relevant anymore, but clearly phonological processes or phonological awareness is a very, very kind of a dominant process or a dominant cognitive deficit uh, that helps us define what dyslexia is and how it manifests itself when a child is trying to read, write, or spell. So you'll have access to that study as well. So I really hope that um, you all have a chance to read both Marianne Wolf's and Pennington's articles as well as others. Now I want to make a, a brief note of this as well. A lot of people are still kind of confused by this concept of rapid automatic naming uh, in terms of their actual remediation. Their thinking is that 
Well, if a child's issues are with fluency, which impedes their ability to have stronger comprehension, because if they're spending all their time and their energy on fluency and dealing with their fluency, then they don't have any cognitive energy left to really bear down on comprehension, which is obviously the end goal of reading. So there's been some studies where they thought, well, if we just help a child become quicker and more fluent with a body of text, that's going to address it's going to address this issue. And quite frankly, that's really missing the point. And I wanted to make that uh, uh, a specific issue here in this presentation because, again, rapid automatic name is really kind of a tip of the iceberg. And it reflects, even though it's very simple to test for, and it gives us very important predictive information, there's a great deal going on beneath the surface that we need to recognize and understand because literally you can start drawing a direct line between our assumptions about the underlying cognitive processes and what we're actually doing in the classroom what we're actually doing in tutoring sessions, what we're actually doing in the home setting when we're working with our kids. So I'm going to walk through these seven related processes that have been identified. I just want to show you this slide with a caveat that just, just slow down. And it, there's a lot of terminology in here, and it seems like it's super complicated, but if you break it down, slow it down, then you'll see that it's really quite uh, manageable. So the concept is that in the reading process, right, or decoding process, so to speak, there are many, many pieces to the puzzle, right? First, we need to understand that we, we need to make sure that the reader is attending to the stimulus, right? And that means that they're looking at the letter or looking at the word. Then, don't get distracted by all this bi-hemispheric visual processes. What that means is, all that means is that both sides of the brain need to detect, discriminate, and realize or recognize the pattern of a particular letter that they're looking at or the pattern of a particular word. Okay, that's all that means. Now remember, all these processes are happening within milliseconds. So if you are a struggling reader because of your rapid automatic naming issue, then the milliseconds that it takes you to uh, attend to all these issues or all these processes are extended and cumulative. So then, therefore, you break down in any one of these steps, then it's going to break down across all these different processes. So you go from initial detection and discrimination to taking that visual pattern information, thinking about it, so to speak, pulling from your database and your brain what those, what they call orthographic representations, right? The form of the letters, the form of the words. Now, all this is happening, you know, simultaneously almost for us because it's in milliseconds. Attend, detect, discriminate, pull from your database the uh, orthographic representation, then integrate that with what you know about the sound associated with that orthographic representation, that letter. So what does that sound like? That's sound symbol relationship, right? And then at the same time, you're at, then to the next level, you're accessing, you're retrieving those uh, sound phonological labels in memory. You're putting that all together and then you're activating oral motor skills so that you actually can take all that information, integrate it, and then speak it or say it. So again, if you think in terms of, well, we just got to teach them how to read faster or read more fluently, you're completely missing 
all the different processes that go into getting to that level. I hope that makes sense. It's just really breaking down processes that happen in milliseconds. So, you know, we're going to talk about, not in this particular, in, in another module, because I don't think it's appropriate to talk about it in depth here, we're going to talk about that retrieval process, the, the, the development of automaticity, and the impact that has on your vocabulary and um, your ability to kind of use all of that for um, semantic reasons and syntactic reasons. Now, uh, just a very quick note here. Uh, we're all from, quite familiar with Sally Shaywitz. This is one of her seminal studies about um, the neural systems that we found with regard to uh, emphasizing phonological awareness. And there are three areas here that are have been well documented in many, many studies that are the core areas that have to do, and the differences in those core areas that have to do with uh, the difference between a dyslexic and non-dyslexic or typical and dyslexic reader. And I mentioned earlier, I showed you the slide about how we're now being able to parse out in the differences with regard to rapid automatic naming. Now let me spend a little bit of time with the definition of ADHD, and we'll finish up this uh, this first part of the module. I think all of you probably have seen this, but I think it's such a beautiful representation of someone who really struggles with attention, concentration, and self-regulation. Now, with regard to the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Mental Disorders, fifth edition. Uh, that is, at least in the United States, is the kind of the, the base model that we use for uh, diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, globally, we use the International Cl Classification of Diseases, and uh, that I think is now in the 10th edition. There, if you think about it, and I know many of you already know this, I'm just going to review this with you. Three core behavioral symptoms, uh, really excessive activity level relative to your developmental status. In other words, the activity level for a 10-year-old is quite different than you would expect the activity level for a 4-year-old. Impulsivity and inattention. And in the new definition, there are three subtypes. There's the person or the child who deals with both hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. There are those who are predominantly inattentive and those who are predominantly hyperactive impulsive. Now, one good thing about DSM-5 is that they've begun to start emphasizing differences within the age groups. I think it's really early stage, and they haven't really sussed that out as much as I think they should, but at least they're beginning to identify systems based on the context. So you'll hear a lot about culturally the difference between how families or schools deal with a hyperactivity and inattention in Europe, in Sweden or Italy or England versus how they emphasize things in the United States. I do believe that that is very largely due to the context and the assumptions and the expectations with regard to the context or the environment in which the child finds themselves. I know in my practice for many years, there was always a big struggle with regard to uh, kids who had this kind of self-regulation issue if they were in a setting that was particularly rigid in terms of the behavioral expectations of the child. So in other words, in some schools, there's a cultural value in terms of allowing kids to move or allowing to making room for kids who whose wiring as such requires more movement for them. Whereas in other environments in certain schools, I mean, there is an expectation that these kids are going to be quiet, stay in their chair. And that's extraordinarily difficult for a child who has this kind of wiring. So we're getting a little bit better with regard to context, but we've got a long way to go. Now, there are, there's this thread that starts to run through 
this definition that I've been using for 25 years. And it has to do with this concept of self-regulation, whether it has to do with poor impulse control or the features of inattention. So impulse control has all about is all about the you know the inability to kind of modulate your response to stimuli, right? So it manifests in different ways. If you are in a social situation, your poor impulse control may have a really significant impact on your ability to negotiate uh, normal friendships or relationships. In an academic task, poor impulse control can have a can manifest as a very uh, difficult challenge for kids and adults to be able to maintain goal-driven, focused behavior relative to their developmental status. So what happens is if they struggle with impulse control, to be colloquial, it can be very irritating to people. And they very quickly can label this child a problem child or a difficult child. Now, we'll talk about that in terms of a child who has dyslexia, who has uh, chronically been in an environment where we as the adults have missed the, the way the child's brain is wired so that it looks like poor impulse control, but quite frankly, it's, it's their social emotional response to being chronically misunderstood. Now, features of inattention is something that we see more often with many kids who are misunderstood or mislabeled or not properly getting the support they need with their reading, writing, and spelling. Because if over time they struggle with decoding, or if over time they struggle with fluency or comprehension, then just you're going to end up being distractible, and you're going to end up having difficulty staying on task. But the driver is not necessarily neurological in basis. It's more a learned behavior related to the disconnect between how that child's brain is wired for development of literacy skills and the academic environment that they're in or the environment that they're in at home. So we're going to talk about that in much greater detail in part two. Now, again, I'm going to go back to this concept of ability to self-regulate. So if you were to weave a thread through the fabric of attention difficulties and modulating and behavior difficulties, we're really talking about the child or the adult's ability to regulate their behavior dependent upon what's appropriate for the environment that they're in. So when we talk about specifically about executive functioning, it is, it is a set of mental processes, but it's really about the child's ability to regulate their behavior. And again, so if they're in an academic setting, and it all depends on what their developmental status is, their ability to plan, organize, strategize, and maintain age-appropriate focus, concentration, and output, then you start to see a disconnect. So it's that whole idea of being able to plan and execute at a level one would expect based on the age of the child or the person or the adult, rather. So it's this ability to self-regulate is not well delineated or, or discussed in the DSM-5, but as parents, specialists, and educators, it is absolutely critical that we understand in uh, a child and how their brain is wired with regard to their ability to self-regulate because that has, again, a direct impact on the kinds of goals that we create in order to support the child and remediate their issues. So this is, um, I'm going to finish up part one here and I'm going to make it a separate sub-module so that you can jump into module two whenever you like. But I hope that's useful for you in terms of the beginning understanding of just 
from a not only just a intellectual level but also a philosophical level with regard to okay I'm building out my template I'm building out my lens so that when I see these kids I know what I see versus seeing just what I know I know what I see versus just seeing what I know because it will have a profound impact on these kids lives and in fact in if you're a manager in a business it's going to have a profound impact on your ability to manage your, your employees as well so uh, again I hope that you found that useful um, this is going to wrap up part one and we'll move on to part two whenever you're ready thank you